Hello and welcome to another episode of Ready to Scale. I'm Ellie Perlman, your host broadcasting from sunny California. When I'm not behind the mic, I buy multifamily properties with passive investors who partner with me on my deals. And these days we are actually under contract on 494 units in um, Georgia, right outside of Atlanta. Um, this is a class B asset cash flow in very, very conservative investment. So if you like to join me and invest in this deal, go to my website, ellieperlman.com, and you can see all the information there. It's a beautiful property, um, very conservative underwriting, and I'm investing my own money in the deal. So I'm very excited about this one. Um, and of course, this is um, only um, open to accredited investors. This is a 506C raise. And just a disclaimer, I'm not an investment advisor and every investment has risks, risk. so please reach out to your investment advisor, your CPA, your attorney, and consult with them before you make any investment decisions. Okay, so today I want to talk about the new eviction moratorium um, that um, got into effect uh, about a week or, or so, and I know it created a lot of buzz and a lot of investors are talking about it. And I just wanted to share my thoughts with you about um, what we're doing now on our properties um, and why I think it's actually not as bad as you might think um, and why and how it's actually different than the previous eviction moratorium. So if we're talking about the uh, previous one, let's just start by say, by kind of describing it a little bit and talking about what that was. So the eviction moratorium that uh, actually expired, the original one, was um, basically, um, own, it, it, it was more inclusive. So we basically included, um, it was a halt on eviction for all types of tenants. Doesn't matter if they lost their jobs or not. It didn't matter if, you know, if they were making $250,000 a year or $25,000 a year. Um, everyone was protected. Um, and when I say everyone, it's mainly, it's either the, the um, properties that the landlords, the owners took an agency debt. So Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae, they basically said, all of our loans, there's an eviction moratorium on, on those um, assets. And if you didn't go through an agency um, debt, which is very, very popular with multifamily, then um, basically it was kind of depending on the state. So some states had um, a more inclusive eviction moratorium and some of them actually um, had a, a pretty loose one or, or not at all. And so it really depended on where you were um, in the U.S. But, you know, all of our assets, all of them um, are agency or financed by agency debt. And so we actually had to um, obviously respect the eviction moratorium um, and we couldn't um, evict any of our tenants that didn't pay. Now, yes, some tenants are in, you know, real, you know, there's a real issue and they're really are trying to do their best and they're, they've been good tenants before, but some tenants stopped paying way before um, COVID and some of them are simply taking advantage of the situation because they know that they don't need to pay. And that was an issue in the, um, you know, in the past with the original, the first eviction moratorium. And there was nothing much you could do about it. Um, you couldn't evict them. You couldn't charge them late fees or anything like that. Um, and so we did our best to collect and we've maintained very high collection rate. Um, but that was the past. And then there were a few weeks in between, maybe a month, where uh, basically the eviction, the old eviction moratorium has expired and there was nothing in place. Um, and then overnight, landlords and tenants learned that there's a new, uh, you know, there's a new sheriff in town, there's a new eviction moratorium. Um, and I'm going to go over, you know, who is basically protected. But um, one of the main differences um, is that you know this one is nationwide it's basically um it's applicable to all states um all properties doesn't matter if it's agency debt or not or bridge loan for in, bridge debt for instance um and it should expire by the end of the year um and hopefully you know obviously i'm hopeful that it's not going to be renewed but 
Um, I don't think it's as bad as the previous one. I actually think that the original eviction moratorium was much harder than this one. Uh, and I'll explain why. First and foremost, the main difference is that you can still evict tenants that are not paying. As a landlord, that's a huge difference. You couldn't start the eviction process with the previous one. In this case, you can still start the eviction process. So you have some states and some counties um, that require 30 days notice, and some of them require three days notice. In Georgia, for instance, depends on which county your property is located in. And basically, you can start the eviction process if someone is not paying, and the tenant, it's on them to basically come to you, hand you over a declaration form that um, I believe the CDC actually drafted, sign on it and say, here's my signed declaration form. You uh, cannot continue with the eviction process. So this is a major, major difference because in the original eviction, eviction moratorium, Tenants didn't have to do anything. They, uh, ma many of them, when we went and knocked on doors, when our staff went and knocked on, on doors to ask, hey, where's the rent? They didn't answer the door. They were, they were clearly inside. That's, you know, what, what we know. They were not answering the phone. They were not, they were ignoring the letters. If they continue doing this in the, under the new eviction moratorium, they can and will be evicted. And that's a huge difference because many of the tenants that are not paying, they disappear basically. They go, um, you know, off the radar and they just don't answer and they think that the problem is just going to go away, which obviously it doesn't because in any case, under the old world or the new world of eviction moratorium, you still have to pay your debt by the end of the day. Um, but the, you know, the fact is that right now you have to communicate with your lender and you have to know about the declaration form and you need to sign it. And only then we have to halt the eviction. Um, some landlords can say, we don't believe you can tell that to the tenant and they, they're taking a risk. So the tenant can either say, okay, I'm, I'm going to leave or the tenant can take them to court. Um, so that's always a risk, but at least there are, there are more opportunities, there are more options for landlords to act based on what they think is right. Um, and, and so, and I want to go, um, over the declaration. So I want you guys, I want you to understand what the tenants need to sign on. Um, and it's important to understand that the declaration, when you sign it, you're under penalty of perjury. So if you're um, signing something that is not right, if you're signing on a declaration, which you cannot change, you cannot amend it, then it's, it, it's, a, it's basically criminal and you can be sued, um, you know, by the landlord, by the state, um, if you lied. Um, and, you know, obviously, as a landlord, you can choose whether you believe the tenant or not, um, whether you want to take them to court or not, but you have options. So I want to go over it because it's, if you really look, if you took a minute to um, actually look at the declaration, you'll see that most people do not fall under, you know, the, all the circumstances that the declaration actually um, describes, especially if you are in class B or A assets, that's going to be a little bit challenging for your tenants to declare what the declaration actually includes. Um, and, and of, of course, listen, of course, there's going to be people who are going to try and scam the system. We've seen that with the PPP loans. Um, there's always people who are going to try and do that, but that reduces the number of people that are going to be protected from eviction um, by a large you know, amount. So I want to go over the declaration form and, and just not read it fully to you, but just so you understand, it basically says, I certify under a penalty of perjury um, that the, the foregoing are true and correct. The number one is that I have used best efforts to obtain all available government assistance for rent or housing. So they have, they're basically declaring that they have tried to get government assistance to pay rents and there are um, many programs, you know, today. 
The second one is that they're basically declaring that they either, that they're getting less than $99,000 in annual income if they are single or in 198,000 if they're filing jointly or, or for married uh, couple. To be honest with you, most class B, C, and D assets um, are probably going to earn less than that. Class A, maybe, maybe not. Um, but So I don't see this as, as a major issue. Um, the next one, the next part of the declaration form says that I'm unable to pay my full rent or make full housing payment due to substantial loss of household income, loss of com compensatable hours of work or wages, layoffs, or extraordinary out-of-pocket medical expenses. Now, that was not part of, none of it actually, was part of the original eviction moratorium. And so, basically somebody who's signing this declaration form is declaring that they either, they either had a huge out-of-pocket medical expense, which is usually COVID, cancer, something like that, or that they actually were impacted because they lost their job or their hours were cut um, so they can make the payments. Before, it didn't matter if you had your job, if you even got a promotion and you decided not to pay, nobody could have evicted you. So this is a major um, thing that it's also, you know, it's a major difference and it's also easy um, to ask for a proof and it's easy to prove if someone was lying because they have to show their income. And this is where I think a lot of people are going to stop and say, I don't think I can sign this if it's not true. Um, the, and then the declaration form continues and basically I'm um, saying it, it says here that I'm, you know, I'm going, uh, I'm using best efforts to make timely partial payment that are as close to the full payment as the individual circumstances may permit, taking into account other non-discretionary uh, expenses. Um, again, they have to sign that they are making best efforts to make some partial or at least partial payments, um, and also, you know, the declaration continues in saying that if I evicted, I would likely become homeless. Now, how many people can sign a declaration under penalty of perjury that if they're going to be evicted, they're going to become homeless? Probably those in class C and D assets where you have a lot of people that don't even make above $30,000 a year. But people in class A and class B assets that are making 70k okay even if they lost their job are they really going to become homeless they have basically no family members no friends no partner they can live with so they're actually going to become homeless i think this is a very difficult declaration to sign on in my opinion at least um but basically they're saying here if i evicted um sorry if evicted i would likely become homeless need to move into a homeless shelter or need to move into a new residence shared by other people who live in close quarters because I have no other available housing options. How many people have no other available housing options? They can't live in with their parents. They can move in, you know, with friends. Very, very few people actually, uh, you know, fit that, that hit that category. Um, and of course it goes on uh, to say that um, they understand that the eviction moratorium ends by the end of the year and they still have to pay. They actually, um, they declare that they understand they have to pay the rest of the debt. It basically says, I understand that I must still pay rent or make housing payments and comply with other obligations, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so, and basically it ends by saying, I understand that any false or misleading statement or omissions may result in criminal and civil actions for fines, penalties, damages, or imprisonment. So if they're lying, they can go to prison or they can get fines. Um, so this is what, you know, the, the declaration form includes. And again, I'm not naive. I know that some people are going to try and scam the system. They're going to try and get away with paying rents. But the fact that they need to know about this form, they need to find it, they need to download it, um, they need to s and feel comfortable signing on it, that alone, I believe, will cut significantly cut the number of people that are going to stop making payments um, or, you know, 
basically uh, insist that they shouldn't be evicted. So just understanding those differences. And I can tell that on my assets, we're, we keep the, we don't have a lot of, of, um, you know, evictions because it's, we usually invest in class B and, and, um, we make sure that the population is not, you know, making, you know, at least 40, $50,000 a year in the markets that we're investing in, which is Texas, Florida, and Georgia. Um, and so we are continuing with evictions and only if tenant if they do their research and they come to us with a signed declaration, we're not providing them any guidance. We're not, it's not our job to tell them here's how uh, you can uh, avoid uh, paying us rent. Only then we halt the um, evictions and whether we're going to take them to court if we think they're not being truthful. I, don't, I honestly don't know if it makes sense for a thousand, two thousand dollars, um, you know, month uh, uh, worth of um, worth of rent per month if it makes sense for me to send a lawyer and, and do all that um, and I shared that on one of my other solo episodes when I said that you know one creative way to deal with non-paying tenants is to pay them to move out and say let's just why don't you pay half or 70 percent and or I'll pay you you know to move out so you don't have to deal with a door that doesn't pay rent. And I say door that doesn't pay rent. I don't see my tenants as, you know, doors that pay, can pay or cannot pay rents, but it, it helps to kind of put things in perspective. Um, we have one case um, on our property that we, we basically had a tenant that spent a month in a hospital after, um, you know, contracting COVID and, um, through the whole time, the mother was paying, ma made partial payments. Um, and now the tenant is on wheelchair and basically said, Hey, I'm going to move in with my mom. Um, I, I can't take care of myself, so I don't, I don't want to live on, on my own. Um, and, you know, we decided that we're not going to, you know, um, proceed and, and try to collect the rent and, and, and try to, um, um, do what we usually do with tenants, which is basically go to a collection agency and try to uh, collect the, the debt. Cause I, I felt that, you know, how can you go after someone like that? I mean, you have to stay a little bit, um, you know, we, we're all humans. We have feelings, obviously it's a business, but in that case, I personally felt that it wasn't the right thing to do. Um, so we're working on a payment plan, um, and we're just gonna, you know, let her go. Um, but generally speaking, there's always going to be people who are going to try and um, take advantage of the situation. I just think that the new eviction moratorium has a lot more roadblocks for uh, tenants. It doesn't cover, you know, and again, first and foremost, it doesn't cover um, everyone because you have the higher, the higher, um, those, the tenants with the highest um, income are not protected. Um, it doesn't, it doesn't stop landlords from starting the eviction process and they only have to stop if a tenant comes to them with a declaration form after they've done their research and found out that that's what they need to do, sign on it and then send it um, to, uh, to the landlord. And only then we have to stop with the eviction process. So um, just to give, you know, put things in, in perspective and just wanted to share with you how it looked like before with the older eviction moratorium and how it looks like, today with the new one and hopefully you know it's going to expire by the end of the year um and uh, we're not going to have to deal with it um again but i i you know i just want to finish by saying that it, it just shows how location is key in real estate and how the strength of the tenant base is crucial because classes c that were very popular in the past seven years are really struggling right now because they might be cash flowing in the past seven years, but uh, their tenant base is not as strong as class B and probably, you know, class A. And so um, just wanted to leave you with that. I, I hope that that brought um, a little bit of, uh, um, you know, I, I'm just happy to share this information and I, I hope that um, it brought some value to you, whether you are sponsors, whether you are um, passive investors or lenders, whoever is, you know, listening. Um, and that's all that I, you know, that I have for you today. Uh, stay strong, be bold, and I'll see you on the next episode.